Non-equilibrium sorption is an important process for um, remediation and really a variety of chemical um, processes. And the basic uh, conceptual model is shown here. Uh, we have a fluid with some molecules in it here at, at a concentration CF and these are um, the sorbed molecules on the solid. And before what we did was to say that in equilibrium there was a relationship between the concentration here on the solid and the concentration in the fluid. But now what we're saying is that there's a relationship between the rate of change of the concentration in the fluid uh, that depends on the solid and the rate of change of the concentration on the solid depends on what's in the fluid. So this sounds like a kinetic expression like we saw a few weeks ago and indeed the way it's described is with a, kin a kinetic form of a reaction. So this is the rate of change of the concentration on the solid and in this case we have a first order expression where this rate is proportional to the concentration in the fluid to the first power. This term here is the rate constant. Uh, well this is the rate constant in per se and then this is porosity and bulk density and these terms show up in order to have the um, concentrations in the fluid work out to be compatible with the concentrations in the solid. And so what I've done is to condense these into a single term that I just use as the effective rate constant. So if it's a first order irreversible kinetics we have this and basically what this says is the rate of change of the concentration of the solid is proportional to what's in the fluid. Um, and so this can only increase uh, because this could never be negative. So we could just have the rate or the concentration on the, on the solids increasing. Okay, so um, no possibility of reversing that. Well, in some cases we could have this decrease. The concentration on the solid could decrease because the these molecules are coming back off and going into the fluid. So that would be a reversible reaction and we saw that reversible kinetics had two terms. This term for the increase in the concentration of the solid and here a, a term for the decrease, a desorption term. And in this case this is proportional to, the, the, this term here is proportional to the concentration on the solid. So as the concentration on the solids increases this rate decreases and uh, eventually these two uh, are equal and this rate of change is zero and it's possible for this to decrease if the concentration in the fluid decreases then this term here could be greater than that term and this could be negative which would be this case where the, the, the molecules come off of the surface and go back into the water. Okay, so um, if we take a look at this rate expression or this is the one that we'll actually use, what we see is that it's a bit different than what we've used previously uh, because it has the concentration of the solids and the concentration on the fluids as, as variables that we have to know. These are, um, this requires then another expression. So we have to, this is going to change, the concentration of the fluid will change, so we need this expression over here, a rate expression that describes how the concentration in the fluid changes with time. And so what we'll say here is that the concentration in the fluid changes as the negative of the rate of change of the concentration in the solids. And we use these terms here uh, in order for the units to be compatible. Okay, so this rate equals equals this rate here with a negative sign out front and these two terms uh, multiplying. So let's take a look at an example of this first order reversible sorption process. Uh, here's the layout. It's a little circular source 
that emits mass as a pulse and the mass uh, travels downstream and spreads out by dispersion. What's different from last time though is shown here in these contours. These are the contours of the concentration uh, on the solid. And what you can see is that the concentration of fluid is primarily out here, but there's concentration on the solid all back through here. And that's mass that was left behind, that was sorbed onto the solid, um, as this uh, mass in the fluid moved by. Now, the thing that will happen though is that if this is reversible, this mass here that's sorbed onto the solid can come back off and it can sorb into the fluid or it can desorb, get into the fluid phase and elevate the concentrations in the fluid phase. And that shows up if we look at these plots. This is the concentration as a function of time at an observation point downstream here. And the blue line shows the concentration uh, for the baseline case with no sorption. So it goes up about 10% of the initial concentration. That, that decrease from the initial concentration is from dispersion. And then if we first take a look at what happens with irreversible sorption, we get the red line. Um, that the red line shows the concentration in the fluid so it increases and it looks similar to the baseline case except the maximum concentration is only about half of the maximum concentration uh, in the baseline case when there's no sorption and we can see the reason for that because this dashed line shows the concentration that's sorbed to the solid and right here it's increasing and so because there's because it's increasing there's mass that's on the solid and that's why the concentration uh, in the fluid has to be less than it is for the baseline case okay just a simple conservation of mass and so for the baseline case the red case what we see is that the concentration in the fluid drops off uh, and then the concentration that's sorbed to the solid it just stays steady. This low value looks like about 0 0.008 or so. And the red line would just keep on going um, because the process is irreversible. It doesn't change with time. OK, but now if we make it reversible and we allow there to be some desorption, we get a different response. So in this case, in this particular example, it's only slightly different. But it's different in a very important way. The black line shows the reversible case. So here in the fluid, it looks pretty similar, except what we, it's hard to see, but right down here, that black line doesn't hit the, the x-axis here. It's above zero. And we see it a little bit better if we plot it on log scale. Here's the black line going up, following the red line, except here it starts to diverge and now it's off of the red line and really decreasing rather slowly. So right in here this is um, that's an order of magnitude so it's less than two orders of magnitude uh, different from the the peak concentration. So yeah it's decreased but it, whether this is significant or not will really all depend on the, um, the the magnitude of this peak and and how um, how close or how how um, uh, how what the risk is for this contaminant but a two orders of magnitude or this is probably maybe a, I guess a factor of 50 or so reduction in concentration is really it could be quite small um, so the this could be a fairly significant concentration here and you can see that it's not changing much with time. So this is causing a, a, a long tail. Um, that's, that's what it's called, a long tail in the contaminant uh, or the concentration uh, plot. And this long tail is, uh, we saw a similar effect with matrix diffusion. And so now we see the same kind of thing qualitatively with this irreversible sorption. And this is a problem because this is causing, this is the concentration in the water phase 
um, and so this is um, this is causing these elevated concentrations to persist and we can see why it's happening here with this black dashed line this is the concentration on the solids and compared to this case here where the sorption is irreversible we can see that in a reversible case the, the concentration on the solids is decreasing um, and that's causing the concentration that we show here. I should point out also in order to plot this on the same um, scale um, I'm plotting the concentration on the solids times the um, uh, bulk density divided by the porosity. If you don't do that then they're there are quite a few orders of magnitude different and they don't show up on the same scale. Okay, so there's an example and let's go ahead and set this up in uh, Comsol. <clears throat> so here's this example and um, I think the important thing to see here in the definitions is right here. This is the CS rate and it's the expression that I had in the PowerPoint and here are the rate constants the porosity and bulk density we'll need so we define them here uh, there's the velocity of the fluid uh, we have a domain point probe and we have a step to turn the source off and the geometry is shown here so this is the geometry that we used for the Peckley plume problem where we've got a circular geometry in there to use as the initial concentrations. So this differs from the previous example for the equilibrium sorption where I showed you a, a different way of setting up a, a source. Um, for your homework what I would recommend doing is using the way that I th the way that you set up the source in the previous problem uh, for for this one so it'll be a bit of a departure from this particular example. You could do it this way though, this, it's fine. The, just the details of how the source is set up, they, they don't really matter to the uh, results. Okay, so here's uh, the example, or here's a, the difference from the previous example. In this case, what we need is to have two physics interfaces, one for concentration on the fluid and one for concentration on the solid. And the reason for that is because they'll be transported differently. Uh, and so let's take a quick look at the fluid first. The fluid, we have the um, x velocity of the, of the fluid flow, porosity and bulk density, which are defined, the diffusivity or dispersion, I'm sorry, dispersion constant there, um, which is also defined and the rest of this stuff, the source is set up like we've seen before with an initial concentration and an inflow um, boundary condition where the inflow rate is uh, set to one and we multiply it by this step function. Now here's how we do the uh, reversible sorption. We have a chemical reaction that is used to describe the sorption. And that chemical reaction is shown here. There's a CS rate. Actually, yeah, well, we can take a look. The, this is the, uh, the CS rate term that we saw above. And this is the, the bulk density and porosity. So I remember when we were looking at this in the PowerPoint, Uh, it's this expression here in the PowerPoint. Okay. And if we take a look at the expression or the interface for the um, solids, uh, we see an important difference, and it's shown here. And if we look down here to the velocity field, um, the velocity of the fluid is set to zero. Okay, and so basically what we're assuming is that if it's sorbed to the solid, it, the advection is zero. And so that's, um, that's, this, that's what we're assuming, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fine assumption. 
and that's why we need to have these two interfaces. We go down here to reactions and here's just the CS rate term. So this is the rate at which the concentration that's on the sorbed, sorbed on the solid is increasing. So the mesh for this problem, just a, just a simple default mesh. And what I did was to run three different studies. A baseline case where I set these two rate constants equal to zero. Absorption case. This is this is the uh, irreversible sorption, where I set the, the desorption rate to zero, and then sorption and desorption, where I use the values of the variables that are shown here. And so we do those analyses. And I plotted them all together uh, on this plot group. And this is the plot that we just saw. Um, baseline case, red is sorption only. And black is sorption and desorption. So I think it's worth taking a look at the um, graphics the, that show how these concentrations uh, evolve with time. And so this is, um, this, like we saw in the previous video, this allows us to see how the um, how the concentrations in the how the concentrations in the liquid are changing with time, and better than the uh, the, the snapshots. So here we go. Um, you can see by this time the concentration here. These colors. Uh, have diminished quite a lot as a result of dispersion and you can barely see the color right here of the concentration in the fluid but we can see the contours that are absorbed onto the solid really quite readily and those persist for a long time and it's these um, contours that are identifying the concentration on the solids that give rise to um, basically this slowly declining curve here. So I should just point out that we see the we see how the concentrations are changing the fluid uh, in a relative way much better with a plot like this than we saw with these panels here um, where what's happening in this case is the color the, the, the maximum color is um, is being rescaled with each image, and so that's um, that's software works by default, but it it's not necessarily that way. Um, what could be done when I made the panels up? What I could do is just go here to the um, to the setup, and let's see if I go here to range and the default is for the um, the range to scale to the maximum and minimum of, of each time that you're making a plot but if you just uh, set the manual color range and data range uh, then you can set up the uh, data range and the color scale based on the well based on whatever you want and then when you go and make individual panels those are kept constant and so using that kind of approach you can get a, uh, a set of, of panels that have the same kind of um, uh, the, basically preserve the relative magnitude of uh, the the changing concentration in a in a way that's that's faithful rather than having this rescaling uh, each time. So there are there, there are advantages to each one, uh, but I just wanted to make you aware that that you have the choice of doing it either way.